This week we're going to talk about ethics. And before we get going, just as a preamble, it's a really huge subject. It spans many disciplines, addresses a wide variety of like very real problems. And as machine learning practitioners, we really need to have a student mindset here and not necessarily assume that we have the answers because these are really not easy problems. And I personally am not an expert. There's excellent resources that we found and we recommend those at the end. So when people teach tech ethics, of which ML ethics is a subset, but an increasingly large subset, what do we actually teach? So this is a paper from the Computer Science Educators Conference from last year. And it looked at 115 different university tech ethics courses. And they found that there's a large variation in the materials covered, right? So some, a lot of them covered law and policy, privacy, surveillance, philosophy, inequality, justice, AI, social impact, and a bunch of other stuff. And there was more consensus in outcomes. And the main outcome for all the for most of the courses was the ability to critique, the ability to spot issues and make arguments and to communicate basically about these issues. So that's kind of the guiding light here. Like this is maybe the best we can hope to get out of just an hour and a half on the subject. And as a last preamble, there's a little parable in that David Foster Wallace commencement address that was widely shared a few years ago. So there's two young fish swimming along and they happen to meet an older fish who nods at them and says, morning boys, how's the water? And the two young fish swim for a little bit. And then one of them looks over at the other and says, what the hell is water? And that's, I think, a perspective that we should try to have in a lot of this is trying to see the, the invisible, like the unspoken assumptions, the backdrop behind some of these issues that everyone is just assuming. Sometimes it's very hard to see. The outline of the lecture is going to be just talking about ethics in general, some long-term problems that concern ethics and AI, some near-term problems, best practices, recommendations, and then some resources to learn more. So starting with what is ethics, you know, one answer might be like, I can tell if something's ethical because I feel a certain way about it. And that's not a great answer. Ethics are not your feelings because your feelings might mislead you to perhaps you're in a difficult situation where it would be a lot easier to take an option that you actually know to be wrong, but you feel like that's just what you should do. So feelings can be misguiding. Ethics are also not laws, right? We're not just talking about AI laws or legality of machine learning or anything like that, because ethics can um, drift out of sync with the laws. They can, they can, you know, supersede laws. You can be a person in a society that you consider unlawful. And so the basis for you to consider that would be your own ethics or some other understanding of ethics. And ethics are also not the societal beliefs. This is related, right? If you are in an immoral society, in order to recognize that, there's some other source of ethics that, that you must have. So then what are ethics? Deep question that I've had a number of theories through the years. And one of the most common one, ones on earth, probably for a lot of people, is the divine command of ethics. So basically, a behavior is moral if it's commanded by the divine. And that might be perfectly accurate, but there's not much that philosophy can say about it because it's just a fate, a complete. So philosophy doesn't really engage with that view. The ancient Greeks had this notion of virtue ethics, which is that a behavior is moral if it upholds a person's a character, a good character, which could also be called virtues. So stuff like bravery, generosity, you know, love. So it's kind of morality through uh, the lens of doing and not necessarily believing anything. It's actually apparently surprisingly robust to philosophical inquiry. Like it, it really holds up from a lot of angles, but there is a lot of evidence now that what you would call virtues or character traits actually just aren't persistent across a person's life and, and are somewhat illusory. So 
it seems weird to base your whole ethics on a notion of something that might not actually exist. And then deontology or like duty-based ethics, sometimes called duty ethics, are the view is that moral behaviors are those that satisfy the categorical imperative, right? Called that by Kant. For example, don't lie might be a categorical imperative or don't kill. And the criticism is that it leads to really counterintuitive moral decisions in a lot of in a lot of situations. And so it has like unacceptable inflexibility to a lot of people. And then maybe most recently, or maybe not, but another view is utilitarianism, which is that a behavior is moral if it brings the most good to the most people. But of course, how do you measure you know, good and how do you do calculus on good times the number of people? So how do you measure utility in another way? There doesn't seem to be a clear winner like among either at least among professional philosophers. So this is a survey of some almost a thousand, you know, practicing philosophy professors. And it was pretty evenly split among deontology, consequentialism, and virtue ethics. Trolley problems, which you've probably seen, are often used to gain intuition about different about a person's ethics just from presenting them with a moral dilemma. And the classic dilemma is you're seeing a trolley, it's about to run over five people, but you could divert it and it would only run over one person. So it's quite contrived, but it's designed to like elicit some intuition about would you rather kill one person or five people, basically. Or perhaps the duty-based ethics, like you have a duty not to kill no matter what. So if you pull the lever, then you're responsible. But if you just stay away, then maybe you're not. So there's all kinds of views on it. And in fact, it's a good meme. So here's one, the trolley's rolling along. You can stop at any time, but it wouldn't disrupt the trolley service, causing the company to lose profits. Or this is known as the boomer trolley problem. Would it be fair to the people the trolley has already killed to divert it now? Or my favorite is if you pull the lever, one person dies and your liability exposure is one wrongful death suit. If you do not pull the lever, five people die and you have no liability exposure. What do you do? Then there's some meta ones, which I just included for fun. Uh, and then there's this one, which is in the trolley problem, it's always assumed that you're the person pulling the lever. But what if you thought about it a different way? What if you actually didn't know which person you were? And this is called the veil of ignorance. And this actually leads to another ethical theory, which I think is maybe the most dominant now which is John Rawls' theory of justice or veil of ignorance. And the thought experiment is, you know, let's say you were reborn into the society you're in, but you didn't know, but it wouldn't be into your life. It would be just into a random life in the society. Do you believe that your society is fair? If you, like, would you choose to be born into this society if you didn't know which member of the society you were going to be born as, right? And so the... Intuition there is we should try to improve society such that from the veil of ignorance, we would feel safe about living in the society. Like we would be happy to be a random person in the society. Do as you would be done by. <clears throat> when applied to technology, I think it's important to understand that ethics are not static, right? They actually change with what technology allows us to do. And for a concrete example of this, we can think of the Industrial Revolution, which just radically changed the calculus of, of human labor. Whereas before the Industrial Revolution, all work on Earth was done by you know, human or animal muscle. After the Industrial Revolution, uh, we had machines doing work in the physics term. And that just leads to different ethical problems and it leads to different ethical decisions. Or for example, the internet is a recent invention, but it seems so like fundamental to how we live today that people talk about internet access being a human, that is a new thing. Or if you look at the way reproduction has been happening for all of history, there's certain ethics associated with it. And a lot of them have radically changed in just the 20th century and, and the 21st century. First with the invention of birth control, that's reliable and cheap. Then in order to have a child, you, no one needs, you, you personally don't need to be pregnant anymore. There's surrogate pregnancy, which would be hard to explain to 
your great grandparents, for example. Now there's embryo selection. So you can actually do genetic testing on a number of embryos, select the one that is best under some metric, and then implant that one. And then in the future, in the near future, we might have artificial wombs. So you can in fact have children without ever going through pregnancy. And of course, genetic engineering and stuff like that. Or lab-grown meat. I think the ethics of being vegetarian or not will change if there's uh, really abundant and cheap lab-grown meat instead of farm-raised meat. There's a good book about this uh, called Right or Wrong, which is a fun read if you're into this kind of stuff. I can move on. And we can think about long-term problems that are ethical in AI. So the first, I think a lot of people's minds go to autonomous weapons and maybe they go into a place that is a little easy to dismiss as maybe far-fetched, not realistic. We don't have to worry about it. It's just a movie. But of course, as the saying goes, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. So Israel apparently has autonomous robo snipers on their borders today and just I think last weekend or something, there was an article about the New York City police deploying the Boston Dynamics spot robot, which actually anyone can buy now. I think it's only like $60,000 or something, but they were deploying it in like a situation of a crime in progress. So I think this will be something our generation is going to grapple with for sure. Replacing human labor is another concern, right, that seems to be on the horizon still, but is also creeping up on us. And the traditional view is humans have been working certain jobs that now AI is taking or robotic labor might be taking in the near future. And particularly with the pandemic, you see a lot of articles where millions of people have lost jobs and it's dawning on a lot of people that maybe they'll never get them back because they'll actually be replaced by AI or robots in just 2020 and 2021. Now this could be good and bad. It could be bad if there's no social safety net or no other job for you to have and you're no longer able to work the only job you were qualified for because now a robot has it. And that's just a couple of hours ago, I saw on Reddit a shower thought the problem isn't that robots are taking over our jobs. The problem is that we've created a world where that's somehow a bad thing. But it really should be a good thing that we don't have to do a lot of these jobs because robots can do them now. The problem is in our society, it's not like a robot is replacing you and then you get the pay that you would have got. It's a robot's replacing you. Some company saves money and then you don't get an income at all. But it's also good and we just have to figure it out because there is a mega trend of the um, demographic inversion. And so what that means is the world population is basically topping out right at around 10 to 12 billion. And there was a huge birth uh, spike and it's different in different countries, right? The United States fa famously had the baby boom, but for example, in Africa, the population is very young even today. Like their baby boom was basically like right now or maybe 10 years ago. And in China, they instituted the one child policy, which obviously has the effect that for every um, single person of working age, there are two people of retired age. And that's not quite true just yet, but it will be true in 20 to 30 years. And if that's true, then basically the economy can function as, as currently designed, right? Like our economy really depends on growth and it depends on a certain ratio of economically productive people to children and retired people. And if you invert that ratio, then you basically need to make up the labor from somewhere. And Rodney Brooks is a roboticist, I believe from MIT, also the founder of iRobot, pretty brilliant person. And this article, which I recommend you click on, talks about how we basically need robots in order to have a functioning economy in the next few decades. An interesting spin on this worry, though, is AI not necessarily replacing human labor, but controlling human labor. And so if you think of like the Amazon fulfillment warehouse, 
it's worked by people, but the efficiency comes from basically machine learning, allocating labor in such a way that a person really has no agency, right, in this environment. So this is an article from The Verge. How hard will the robots make us work in warehouses, call centers, and other sectors? Intelligent machines are managing humans, and they're making work more stressful, grueling, and dangerous. And that led me to remember the short story, which I recommend you guys read, called Mana, Two Views of Humanity's Future. And the first sentence is, depending on how you want to think about it, it was funny or inevitable or symbolic that the robotic takeover did not start at MIT, NASA, Microsoft, or Ford. It started at a Burger G restaurant in Cary, North Carolina on May 17th. And it's very much in this vein of AI not necessarily having to have a physical body in order to, I guess, subvert human life. And the final worry is, well, the AI may be, if it's super intelligent and it has robotic labor, it actually just doesn't need humans at all. It can replace humans entirely. And that's a screenshot from the matrix, if you guys haven't seen that. So what's common in all of these long-term problems? What's common is the problem of alignment. So this notion of alignment is often expressed through this other parable of the paperclip maximizer, which I think is, is from the philosopher Nick uh, Bostrom, who works on AI safety and, and related concerns. But basically the story goes is that assume there's a artificial general intelligence, so some, an entity that's as smart as a typical person, not necessarily any smarter, and it's given the goal of producing paperclips. And that's its goal. So it's able to act in ways that an intelligent entity is able to act in, which includes making itself more intelligent, potentially by developing, you know, its own AI. And so eventually develop super intelligent AI. And because its goal is only producing paper clips, it starts just tearing up the streets and like metal buildings and stuff and eventually turns every atom on earth and then every atom in space into just paper clips. So obviously something went very wrong. By the way, universal paper clips, uh, if you click on that in the slides, it takes you to a game where you play as an AI producing paper clips. Fun. This is actually an old lesson. If you think about it, like you rub a lamp and a genie comes out and then they tell you, you have three wishes but then you word the wish in such a way that it's actually becomes a curse for you. And then you use the second wish to revert that. And then the third wish is that there's some other thing um, that's problematic about how exactly do you communicate your goals and values to a technology, basically. Or you can think of Frankenstein and his monster where you create something and you think it's under your control, but it in fact is not if it's given enough power. So the guiding principle for basically everything, I think, in this lecture is that the AI systems we build, including the current limited machine learning systems we build today, need to be aligned with our goals and values. So this problem of alignment is a very deep topic, and it's actually an active area of research at a number of places, including at Berkeley, at the Center of Human Compatible Artificial Intelligence, of which Peter Abiel is one of the faculty, so that would be useful to hear from him as well at some point. But I think this alignment lens is useful for near-term problems as well, not just long-term problems. And so let's get to those now. So let's talk about hiring. Here's a headline you might've seen or something like it. Amazon scraps secret AI recruiting tool that showed bias against women. And there's a, been a number of headlines about using machine learning systems for recruiting or in hiring in some way. But let's say we're trying to work on something like that. So we're trying to develop a machine learning model to, and specifically this is given a resume, we want to predict the hiring decision, the eventual hiring decision. So to train the machine learning model, we need data, right? Now we have a choice. What should the data contain? Should it contain Hiring decisions, which is what we're trying to, so like obviously it's going to contain resumes, but then what's the label on the resume? Is it the hiring decision that was made or is it the eventual job performance given the person was hired? You might want to predict job performance instead of the hiring because 
what if they were hired and then they were immediately you know fired two months later or if it just didn't work out but what you really want to hire you know who you really want to hire are people who get hired and then get promoted quickly and are leaders at the company okay so the data comes from the world and the world is known to be biased in many ways right there's bias in the hiring pipeline so potentially maybe if we're hiring for software engineers, maybe not enough women are getting educated for the job. So in the pipeline, there just aren't that many women candidates. And there's reasons for that that come from sources of bias in the world. There could be bias in the hiring decision itself. So by the people doing the hiring intentionally or unintentionally, they are selecting people that match some prejudice uh, that they have. And there's bias in the performance ratings, which is if that's the signal we're trying to predict, then, then maybe people are getting promoted, not because they're actually really good at the job, but because they're good at something else, or they match the expectation of the promoter in certain biased ways. So because we know the world to be biased, then basically no matter what decision about how to structure the data we make, the data is also biased. And therefore any model we train on that data is also gonna be biased. Okay. And then the model is trained in order to help or take some kind of action. So what is that action? Are we scouring the internet for resumes, predicting whether it's a good candidate and then feeding the candidates into some pipeline so that we can reach out to them? Or is it that we are just running the machine learning model alongside human decision makers and we're just double checking how the decision, the human decision agrees with the machine learning decision? Or are we actually using the machine learning prediction about whether a human would hire this person to actually do the hiring? And let's say we are doing that. In that case, the action that the machine learning model suggests directly impacts the world because basically whatever we predict, we actually, we predict that this person would be hired. So then we actually do hire them. And so that adds to the state of the world, which then changes the data set, which then if we retrain the model, changes the model. And we're basically amplifying existing biases that we knew from the beginning were present in the world. And amplifying existing biases in the world is usually not aligned with our goals and values. And for that reason, Amazon scrapped the machine learning model in their hiring pipeline. So the next thing we can talk about is uh, this notion of fairness. And in order to look at that in more detail and just really dig into it, we're going to use a case study uh, about Compass, which is the Correctional Offender Management Profiling for Alternative Sanctions system that was in the news a couple of years ago. And the goal of this system is to predict recidivism, which is basically committing another crime, such that judges can consult the Compass score, which is between 1 and 10, in their pretrial sentencing decisions, which is basically do I let this person go uh, free on bail or do I actually hold them in detention until their trial, which can actually be several years in, in some cases. The motivation behind developing the system was to do what Kevin said and, and actually be less biased than human decision makers because the criminal justice system is notoriously biased right against certain races. And uh, the goal of using a machine learning system is to try to be more fair when it comes to these kind of decisions. So the solution that the company came up with, the company is called North Point, is to gather data, right? So there's certain features about the person, like age, whether the crime was violent, the number of crimes in their past, like number of years in jail, like a bunch of things that you might think are relevant, but notably exclude protected class attributes such as race. So the model does not have direct access to these protected attributes and then train the model and really make sure that statistically the score given between one and 10 corresponds to the probability of recidivism in an accurate way. And also in an accurate way, that's accurate the same way across the different demographic groups um, that we care about. So we'll talk more about this in a second, but basically the solution is to gather data and do a good job and exclude protected class attributes, right? And yet there's a famous ProPublica report 
machine bias. There's software used across the country to predict future criminals, and it's biased against blacks. So they give this figure of the risk scores that the Compass system um, gave. And this is in uh, Broward County in Florida. They got the information through a Freedom of Information Act request. And like the first thing they noticed is it's pretty even distribution of scores, one through 10, for the black defendants. But for the white defendants, it's definitely skewed to the low risk scores. And the other thing they noticed, they actually had to gather the data um, themselves, it took a couple of years, but they, for every person in the FOIA data dump that they got, they actually didn't know whether they re recidivated or not. So they um, had to look up arrest records for the next few years and, and they figured out like which person actually recidivated and, and was arrested and went back to jail which did not, they got that data, which was a huge project in itself. And one thing they noticed is that so there's kind of two sets of people that they cared about here. One was labeled as high risk, but actually did not reoffend. And so among white people, that was 23%. Among African-American people, that was 45%. And then there's another set, which is labeled lower risk, but yet it, they did reoffend. And so among whites, that was 48%. Among African-Americans, 28%. So there's that clear disparity in those numbers. There's a big article. And in the slides that follow, I'm going to borrow heavily from Arvind Narayanan and an excellent YouTube tutorial called uh, 21 Definitions of Fairness. So there's a bunch of definitions that we can talk about. And one of the first ones we encounter is bias. And in machine learning, we often mean statistical bias. And so specifically, that's the difference between the estimators or, you know, the machine learning models expected value and the true value. And so in the sense of statistical bias, the compass scores are not biased with respect to rearrest. Okay. Which is an important caveat because we only have data for arrests, not crimes committed. Okay. And there, and there may well be, you know, there's a lot of reason to believe there is bias in which crimes by which race of people result in arrests. So there's bias in that process, but, but that's also the data that the ProPublica people gathered and they found something that they perceived as unfair. That was also re-arrest data, but it's also just important to point this out because that's, that's the water here as we've got to see. There's always, there might be bias in the data, but there's also bias in the data generating process AKA the world. And so we always have to look at both. In any case, the compass scores actually predict the chance of recidivism, like the, the risk score maps to the probability of recidivism at the same rate across these two demographic groups of African-Americans and, and whites. So in that sense, it is free of statistical bias. It is well calibrated across these groups, but is this definition of fairness an adequate fairness criterion, right? Is this definition aligned with our values? And that's a deeper question. And to get at it, let's actually just take a step back and just look at binary classification, okay? And this will apply to the problem we're talking about now, but it also applies to a lot of other things like whether to give someone a loan, whether to hire someone like we talked about, insurance, all kinds of things. So in binary classification, you have the, this is basically matrix of true negatives, false positives, false negatives, true positives. So if someone was labeled as high risk and they indeed recidivated, then that's a true positive, right? But if they were labeled as high risk and they did not recidivate, then that's a false positive and so on. So you've seen this in your machine learning classes. But the interesting question here is what do the different stakeholders want from the classifier? What would they perceive as fair? So the decision maker, AKA the judge or the prosecutor, what they care about is they don't want to make mistakes, right? So of those that they label high risk, how many actually recidivated? So that's the predictive value of the estimator and it's true positives over the true positives and false positives, which are all the people predicted as high risk. The defendant cares about something different though. 
they care about the probability that they will be incorrectly classified as high risk because they want to go free before trial. And if they're not likely to recidivate, then they should be labeled as low risk. And so they're really afraid of being labeled as high risk. And that would be the false positive rate, which is false positives over false positives and true negatives. So that's like the people who are labeled high risk, but actually did not recidivate or would not have recidivated. And then the society at large might care about the demographic balance of the selected sets. And so that could be a demographic parity. So you want some, you want, let's say the accuracy to be equivalent across demographic groups. And that gets at the notion of group fairness, right? So do outcomes differ between different groups, for example, demographic groups, but you could also define groups in a number of ways, which we have no reason to believe are actually different. And so that's the motivation of the ProPublica article, which is that they did observe that outcomes differed by demographic in this way. By the way, just to put it back into the language we just had, the top row is false positives. So they're labeled high risk, but didn't reoffend. And then the bottom is false negative. So they were labeled lower risk and yet they did reoffend. So the false positive rate and the false negative rate does not have demographic parity here. There was a paper published after the ProPublica article that proved that if an instrument satisfies predictive parity, meaning basically if the plot looks like this in the top, in the top right, so it predicts the same across the different demographic groups. If the instrument satisfies predictive parity, but the actual prevalence of the thing that it's trying to predict differs between the groups, then you actually cannot achieve equal false positive and equal false negative rates across these groups. So it's impossible to both satisfy how Compass would like to define fairness, which is that they predict the same score will predict the same chance of recidivism, no matter what the race of the person is. And the ProPublica definition of fairness, which is they want to see equal false positive and false negative rates across these two groups. It's actually impossible in this case, because the prevalence of recidivism actually differed between the groups. And a lot of these group fairness metrics have natural motivations and there's no correct, there's no like correct fairness definition because it really just depends on the politics of the situation and which um, stakeholder you think is most important and so on. And in fact, it's, there's nothing special about the false positive rate, false negative rate and predictive parity as the three um, metrics. It's actually any three metrics that you might pick, you, you will be able to prove that you can satisfy all of them. And it gets even worse because you might say, okay, well, forget about predictive parity. We only want false positive rate and false negative rate to be equal. And furthermore, we'll actually even allow the model to use protected class attributes like race to make its prediction. But then we would fail. We would fail. Another definition of fairness would be individual fairness, which is basically if you want there to be a single threshold that's used for the sentencing decision or the pre-sentencing release decision, if you don't want that threshold to be different for whites and blacks, then you, you may not be able to achieve this. And if you do want the threshold to be different, then pretty naturally that fails individual fairness because just because of the color of your skin, you're subject to a different standard for pre for pre sentencing release. So then, okay, let's just pick one, right? We just want to include, we just want equal false positive rate across the groups we care about. That's all we want. In that case, we will still sacrifice some utility, which in this case would be the public safety. Like we want to not release people likely to recidivate or on the other end of the spectrum, we might be releasing too few not defendants because we've set the threshold in the point which, yeah, it ensures equal metric that we care about here, but then it's, it's not achieving optimal metric that we should also care about, which is utility in this case. And there's a fun interactive example. I don't, I don't know how fun it is, but there is an interactive example about it. Where the, in a slightly different setting. So this is giving loans. And this is a companion piece to a paper by Wattenberg, Viegas, and Hart. And Moritz Hart is a professor at Berkeley. And I'll have more to say about, about 
about his work later on in the lecture. But yeah, you can basically drag the thresholds. There's two populations, or uh, blue and orange. And then you can say, okay, I want equal opportunity. So I want to maximize true positive rate, or I want equal true positive rate. I want to set different thresholds so that the true positive rate is equivalent for the two populations. Or maybe I definitely don't want to be making decisions based on this group. So I, I have to have the same threshold. What's the best I can do then? Or I want to just maximize profit and I don't care about anything else. Or I want, there's all kinds of different things. It's kind of interesting to play with. So by the way, I said that Compass removed the protected attributes from the data that the model was able to see. And that's, I think, often what, what you think might just solve the problem. Once, okay, we can't, we don't want any differences based on, for example, race. So let's just remove race from the feature set and then we're fine. So that does not work. And you can quantify exactly you know, how it does not work. And uh, Moritz Hart also has done that in a paper. But just a couple of words about why it doesn't work. Machine learning can be very good at finding patterns that maybe humans can't find. So for example, your zip code and your age together might be highly correlated with your race. So you can remove race, but the machine learning model will learn how to basically construct it from your zip code and age or something like that. So you can always pick up on a protected class attribute from other attributes. Okay, so there's trade-offs, right? There's trade-offs between the different measures of group fairness that we looked at. There's a trade-off between maximizing for group fairness versus individual fairness. And there's trade-offs between the notion of fairness and the notion of utility. And it's in fact not specific to machine learning. It applies to human decision-making too, but I think it's maybe good that machine learning has brought this to the fore because now a lot of people are analyzing it. Whereas in the past, the same kind of decisions were being made, but they weren't really as out in the open as, as now. And it's interesting to think of how a human decision might be seen as a prediction. So like the police can search your vehicle if they can reasonably believe that you have some contraband, but that's a prediction. Do you or do you not have contraband? So that's a prediction. So we can gather this data set and take a look at how that predictor, what, what features does it have? Is it biased in certain ways and so on? We don't tend to do that. And then there's a tension between disparate treatment and disparate impact. And this gets into Supreme Court cases and it's a very deep subject. But the basic thing to say is like in that example, is it allowed to have two different thresholds based on race that can end up in front of the Supreme Court and or in front of some court. And what happens in court is that you basically have case by case decisions where the judge considers you know, the full evidence and the full context of the situation and then makes a decision. And that's the decision society settles on. But in machine learning, that just doesn't, the whole point of applying machine learning to stuff like this is to scale it. And so you lose that ability to make case by case workarounds, which is why it's really pushing this to the fore. And so what's the water here, right? We've been just like getting deep into this, but is there something maybe even more fundamental? So here's a tweet from Moritz Hart. And it says, here's an example I found helpful in understanding why opting for a prediction as a solution concept of its own, regardless of all the stuff we just talked about, is already a consequential political act that deprioritized alternatives. So failure to appear in court. Okay, so one approach, you can predict the failure to appear in court and then jail the defendant if the risk is high. The alternative is to ask why people fail to appear in court. And so maybe if you ask that question, you'd recognize that a lot of people fail to appear in court because Maybe they have a child and there's no way for them to take care of their child. Or maybe they don't have a car or money for the bus and they just can't get to it. Or they got a job and they can't take hours off. Maybe they have multiple jobs. Maybe they already have to appear in a different court for something else. So just having that empathy and asking that question, you might recognize that we shouldn't even be trying to predict if people are failing to appear in court. We should just change the system so that people maybe don't have to appear in court. And I thought that was very valuable. And this goes to this diagram that's often shown in a lot of places. I don't know where it's from, so I wasn't able to really, I, maybe it's from this blog, but maybe not. But it's the difference between equality, equity, and justice. 
So in, in the notion of equality, there's a situation, right? There's a fence in front of a soccer game. That's the situation. And we give everyone the same support, which is this little box to stand on. And that works for some people. It does not work for others. And it's equal treatment because everyone got the same thing. But it's not really equitable because to make the situation equitable, you want to actually give more support to the people who need it rather than equally to everyone. And, and, and that's an idea behind affirmative action or other policies and interventions that are designed to produce equity. And then the notion of justice is maybe let's see what the situation actually is. And instead of trying to stack the deck in the current situation, can we actually change the situation so that we address the cause of the inequity? And I thought that's a very valuable perspective to have. Because as computer scientists, I think we have very literal minds, right? And we get on into this one track thing like, oh, it's fair in this way, but not fair in this other way or whatever. And then you argue formulas and false positives, but then taking a step back and just seeing the whole situation, like maybe that's not even the right thing to be doing at all. We can talk about, so we talked about fairness. Let's talk about another near-term problem, that of representation. So if you have ever had a problem grasping the importance of diversity in tech and its impact on society, watch this video. Let's watch the video. And then in the comments to this video, yeah, people posted another, another video, which I thought was also good. So yeah, obviously this doesn't align with our goals and values. And it's sadly not a new problem because for a photographic film, the way that it was designed is to, you know, elicit really good skin tones in, in people. But the problem is they only focused on white people. So they had these, what are called Shirley cards, which is like a card of um, a white lady. And then it's for like, making sure the color temperature and so on is good on photographic film. Obviously a problem that there were no other skin tones. Now they have Shirley cards with multiracial people on them. And it's also not a problem in just our field. So it's, I think it's well known and there's uh, many publications about how a lot of medical testing, like drug testing and all kinds of stuff is mostly done on men. And the lack of females in drug dose trials leads to over-medicated women. A lot of the what is found in the drug trial is like the safe dose and the effective dose and so on. That might be ineffective for a typical man. And then when it's applied to a typical woman who weighs less, it might be an over medication or the same kind of thing can exist or it can't, you can probably observe this in medical trials based on age. So maybe most medical testing is done on maybe mostly healthy people of middle age but then applied to increasingly unhealthy people of advanced age, and that can lead to problems. There's recent improvements though, like in the actual, actually in the vaccine development in 2020, <clears throat> the operation of warp speed, which is the United States government effort to really try to do the phase one, two, three trials at a breakneck pace. They actually had to slow down the Moderna trial in order to find a diverse enough set of participants in their phase three trial which is you know, bad in the sense that the vaccine wasn't approved until a little bit later, but really good in the sense that the phase three trial established that the vaccine is effective in people of you know, all ages, races, and so on. So what's a, how do we solve that? That's, it's obviously not aligned with what we want, but how can they ship a soap dispenser that just doesn't work for a large part of the population? I think a large part of the solution is actually in this New York Times article, just from like yesterday, what is it, the 16th? It's from yesterday, an article called, who is making sure the AI machines aren't racist, largely about Timnit Gebru. And just to read an excerpt, so she was an AI researcher at Stanford at the time, and she went to a conference in about five years ago in Spain. Hundreds of people gathered for the first lecture at the world's most important conference on AI. Some were East Asian, a few were Indian, a few were women, but the vast majority were white men. 
More than 5,500 people attended the meeting. Timnit Gebruth, a graduate student at Stanford, remembers counting only six black people other than herself, all of whom she knew, all of whom were men. I'm not worried about machines taking over the world. I'm worried about groupthink, insularity, and arrogance in the AI community, especially with the current hype and demand for people in the field. The people create, this is what she wrote after getting back from the conference. The people creating the technology are a big part of the system. If many are actively excluded from its creation, this technology will benefit a few while harming a great many. And so a large part of the solution to these problems of representation are including people who weren't previously part of the community in the community of developers. There's great organizations that are fighting for this specifically in machine learning. So Block and AI is the logo here, founded by Timnit, Women in Machine Learning, Latinx and AI. These are three organizations that are, are you know, probably at the forefront of bringing previously underrepresented uh, people into the AI community. So this is very important. Another example that is commonly given is when you used to be, when you search for CEO on Google, you used to get a page of results that looks like this, all white middle-aged men. And that doesn't really align with our values of bringing all kinds of people into positions of leadership. Recently, I just did this search yesterday. It's much a much more diverse set of people now. So somehow or other, it's improving in the Google search. Another example that is often given is gender bias in language. So here's the example in Google Translate, they someone typed, she's a doctor, he's a nurse, translated it to a language, which is uh, Turkish in this case, that doesn't have gendered pronouns, and then translated back to English. Now magically it became he is a doctor and she is a nurse. And that can be shown to like work for a lot of different um, occupations. So that's obviously a problem. The recent improvement, I just tried this just yesterday. So translating the sentence that in Turkish has no gender now doesn't give you a single gender in Google. It gives you a choice. So that's a clear improvement and it, it educates the user that exactly lets them select what they want. This notion of gender bias in language can be seen in word embeddings. So we looked at some word to vec examples in previous lectures, and we showed, it's basically just to remind you, it's a training, this embedding, which is something that converts a word in the vocabulary to a dense vector uh, of real numbers. So word to vec was trained on the large corpus and the weights were published so that people started using them for all kinds of things, basically as the first layer in their NLP application. And they are useful, like, it's interesting to see that, that the embedding picks up on stuff like verb tense and the different relationships between like man, woman, king, queen, whatever, country capital. So these are um, slides from Rachel Thomas's lecture on the subject, but they also reveal harmful biases encoded in the language. So you can say father is the doctor as an analogy and then ask for the analogy with the word mother that like completes it and it will complete it to, to nurse. Although there's a little bit more to say about that because the word doctor is actually removed from the set of results. So it's actually father to doctor as mother is to doctor. But then if you remove the word doctor, then the next word, the next best match is nurse. But if it was like father to doctor as man is to, it, it would probably have something different. It wouldn't say nurse. There is this hidden sexism in the language embeddings. So one potential solution is to try to debias at training time, such that the model never learns this kind of potentially harmful biases. And at the very least make the user aware, like in this example, that there might be bias in like the thing they're seeing. Of course, that's more difficult if you're just using this as a pre-trained first layer for some NLP task. And so like the NLP task might end up biased in certain ways that you can't actually get at very easily anymore because it was embed, you know, encoded in the embedding. Nowadays, we don't use word to vec We use large language models like the GPTs and the BERTs and the T5s and what have you. And as we talked about in the Transformers lecture, GPT-3, part of the reason the weights weren't released by OpenAI is because of uh, societal concerns 
partially from things like this, where GPT-3 can say pretty um, unacceptable stuff if you just get it started with some words. And the thing about GPT-3 is that it learns, it's a very large model, has a large number of parameters, and it learns on a large number of data. The amount of data is so large that you actually can't be sure what's in it. So for example, like all of Reddit is in it, and we know there's very harmful pieces of language in Reddit, but the data set is so large that it's not really feasible to remove like everything that, that seems objectionable. So then you get things like this, and it's like an open problem as to how to deal with it. And so Timnit was in the New York Times just yesterday, and that article talks about how she and actually a fellow scientist, Margaret Mitchell, were fired by Google, ostensibly because of a paper they co-wrote with some University of Washington researchers named On the Dangers of Stochastic Parrots, Can Language Models Be Too Big? So and this is an excerpt from the abstract. They talk about environmental concerns of training these large models, but also concerns about bias from training on such a large amount of data that you don't know what's in it. So we provide recommendations, including weighing the environmental and financial costs first, investing resources into curating and carefully documenting data sets rather than ingesting everything on the web, carrying out pre-development exercises, evaluating how the planned approach fits into R&D goals and supports stakeholder values, and encouraging research directions beyond ever larger language models. Not a very objectionable paper by any means and good advice. Seeing the water here, so part of the argument is should the language models that are trained reflect the world as it presents itself in the data or as we believe it should be? I think that depends on what we're trying to apply the language model to. So if we're trying to apply it in this kind of conversational AI setting where we actually want to speak to GPT-3 and use it to write our emails and so on, the correct answer is probably to the language model should learn to reflect the world as we believe it should be, not the world as it actually is. But if we're applying a language model for the purpose of, let's say, analyzing posts on Facebook in order to find hateful posts in order to remove them, well then, if you remove hateful speech from your training set, then the model you train will not be able to recognize hateful speech when it sees it in production. So I don't think there's a one size fits all answer to this. Like not all language models should be trained on de-biased data, but I believe that some should. And then the second question presents itself, which is if we want to train on data that reflects the world as it should be, do we actually agree on the way that the world should be? And who gets to decide, you know, who gets to impose their vision of the way the world should be? on the rest of society. I don't think there are good answers to this. It's just worth posing as a question. And just to close the section out, you might've seen this article about face recognition. It's about a company called Clearview, which might end privacy as we know it because it ingested a lot of photos from the internet. And now it's available to police departments around the country to basically find people, right? In all kinds of photography by matching them to faces from the internet. And I think this is an example of a clash of, this is how like technology changes ethics. Like the old context of this kind of ethical problem is that if you're out on the street and you're wanted for a crime and a police officer sees you, they have every right to arrest you and you don't have expectation of privacy in public, right? If you're going out in public and you're wanted, that's the risk you're taking on. The new context though, is we changed what in public means. In public now means basically anywhere in the world, like on any street in any city, because there's always those cameras around in the corners, or on any website on the internet. So basically anywhere means in public now, whereas it didn't used to in, in the past. Now, is it ethical to work on technology like this? From one perspective, ostensibly it's used for to catch criminals, right, to reduce crime. On another perspective, it seems to violate a lot of people's notion of what privacy should entail. And then as a little bit of a provocative statement, what if you found out that this particular face recognition technology doesn't work as well as on some ethnicities as it does on some other ethnicities? 
is that an ethical problem in the same way as the other ones we've discussed? Or is that potentially actually good because now you don't think the application of this technology is ethical in the first place? So here's a quote from Fair ML Book. At the same time, debating the merits of these technologies on the basis of their likely accuracy for different groups may distract from a more fundamental question. Should we ever deploy such systems even if they perform equally well for everyone? We may want to regulate the police's access to such tools even if the tools are perfectly accurate. Our civil rights, freedom or movement and association are equally threatened by these technologies when they fail and when they work. What can we do about these problems right now? There was a paper in 2019 called uh, Improving Fairness in ML Systems. What, what do practitioners need? Talk to people in, there's a survey, NLP, predictive analytics, like what Anket was talking about, computer vision, yeah, search re recommender systems. Most people are data scientists or researchers or software engineers. Support in fairness aware data collection and curation, overcoming blind spots, implementing more proactive fairness auditing, auditing complex ML systems, deciding how to address particular instances of unfairness, addressing biases in the humans embedded throughout the ML development pipeline. That would be developers, but also the data annotators, the PMs, yeah. So that's a lot. Some suggestions from Rachel Thomas. Do regular ethical risk sweeping, so like a cybersecurity penetration testing where the red team is trying to get into your website or app or whatever in order to make sure that they can't try to find ethical problems in your machine learning system, hopefully to find that you can't, right? There are no ethical problems, but do it regularly, just like you do uh, pen testing regularly. Expanding the ethical circle, whose interests or experiences or values or desires have we just assumed as we were thinking about this machine learning system instead of actually consulting them and and getting their perspective. Think about the worst case scenario. Could someone abuse the system or maybe steal the system or the data or weaponize it in some way? Or alternatively, what incentives are being created by deploying the system and how is that gonna lead people to behave? Closing the loop. So this kind of stuff is not something you just do once and then you're done with it and then you don't have to do it again. It's something that should be a loop where um, you keep improving. So how do you keep improving? You have to set up a process. You have to identify someone who's responsible for improving. You have to set up feedback channels and uh, yeah, make sure it keeps getting done. One really good practice that I think basically everyone should start doing is this idea of model cards, which came from uh, a line of work actually by Timnit and this particular paper paper is called Model Cards for Model Reporting from 2018, Margaret Mitchell, a bunch of people at Google mostly. But the idea is for whatever machine learning model or system that you have deployed, there should be a page that describes the typical input, output, the model architecture, the performance, the performance should be broken down by whatever is interesting, like maybe demographic group, if that's a relevant factor or data set or geography, like whatever it is, but try to break it down in a way that's informative. And it's just a chance to talk about the, what the model does, what the limit, what the known limitations of the model are, what trade-offs were made in developing the model, what performance it has, should you expect a, a, a given level of performance on some input, uh, the ability to maybe upload your own data to test the predictions and the ability to provide feedback. So it's something that we're adopting at our company. And I think it just makes a lot of sense for like a lot of machine learning applications. And the goal is not to be perfect and unassailable. The goal is to just put it out there with known limitations. And then everyone knows that you have some ways to go and you're working on them and you're aware of it. There's a project called Aquitas. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly from the Center for Data Science and Public Policy that allows you to perform a bias audit on your machine learning model. So you can literally upload data in the predictions and then it'll parse it out in a number of ways. You can set certain class attributes as like the reference and then it'll show you if it's biased on around that reference. And it also includes this fairness tree, which I think might address a question I heard earlier in the lecture, but it basically guides you through like 
how should you be thinking about what metric to optimize for and what definition of fairness is like most applicable in your problem? So just not going to read all of it, but yeah, I'm actually not going to read a lot of it because it's <laughs> very dense. But one of the interesting questions, are your interventions punitive or assistive? So punitive would be jailing people before sentencing, but assistive could be something different that takes you to different parts of the tree. One way to think about it is from my colleague, Eric, I turn it in, is as we deploy machine learning systems, we recognize that we're building on basically a crooked foundation, right? There's deep rooted inequities in our society. There's furthermore, maybe unequal sampling or representation in our data, in our training data. And then we risk deploying an AI system that amplifies these underlying biases. And then furthermore, when the user sees the AI output, they might further reinforce the biases, right? Now, what we could do is try to like un uncrook the pyramid as much as we can. And we can't do, we can't get at the deep rooted social inequities. We like, we, we just can't, but what we can do is we can build an AI team that is diverse enough to bring a variety of experiences to the work so that we have fewer blind spots. We can make AI fairness and transparency a key component of what we do and de-bias AI to the extent possible, which is not 100%, but also display insights about the bias that still remains that we're aware of in the product that the user interacts with, just like Google does, right, with the, the different translations, such that they have the context and they aren't just guided blindly by this AI system. I think an interesting, you know, question is, should we have a professional code of ethics? And, uh, and we, we obviously don't, but some professions do. So I think medicine is the most well-known for this, right? It's the, what's it called? Hippocratic oath, which at least historically doctors had to take when they were graduating from med school and before becoming doctors, you might've heard first do no harm, supposedly the first line of the, of that oath. But yeah, it's basically just saying you're going to use medicine in, in these ethical ways and not harm people. And to say when you don't know how to do something instead of just trying to do it anyway, and respect that to be ethical or to be empathetic with, with your patients and so on. And it's very ancient, right? It goes back to ancient Greece. The armed forces have an ethics regulation, but I don't think it's actually used. It's like 102 pages and I just... I, I, I don't know if people internalize it, but there's the Geneva Con convention and stuff. So I think the armed forces do have some code of ethics that's different from society at large that is internalized to some degree. I'm just not sure how written down it is, but software engineers and machine learning scientists don't. And I think it's an interesting question of whether we should. So where can we learn more? Oops. Rachel Thomas is a co-creator of fast.ai. And she actually has a, a course called Practical Data Ethics. It has six lectures. It covers everything in, in pretty good depth. Or you can just sample the single lecture from the most recent iteration of Fast.ai about ethics for data science. Highly recommended. There, there was a CS294, just like this one, from Morris Hart, professor at Berkeley called Fairness in Machine Learning. And, and this Fairness in Machine Learning is also the name of a textbook that's being written by him um, Salman Barokas and also Arvin Narayananan. And it's a work in progress, but it's very good as is, and I'm sure it'll get even better. There's a very good workshop from some people at CMU called Dealing with Bias and Fairness in Building Data Science ML AI Systems. A great set of slides from a presentation at KDD 2020. I think it's like a whole day workshop, so there's a lot of material. A uh, great book. It's called The Alignment Problem, Machine Learning and Human Values by Brian Chris. Yeah, it's a really well-written book. It covers a lot of terrain here, including the near-term problems, and not just, not just the paperclip maximizer type of stuff, things that are problems today. And Kathy O'Neill has a book called Weapons of Math Destruction, which is about, talks a lot about stuff I didn't even mention, such as you know, like the Facebook newsfeed. How does it influence our politics? And, and that's a very rich subject. I just didn't really have time to get into that. So I thank you.